Now, the second aspect that gets messed up when you try to teach these checks to kids, because I've done enough takeaway check clinics. I do a pure takeaway check clinic all over the Northeast where I literally go for two hours. I go over 30, you know, the, the 20 checks that I have, and then we go out and we throw them. All right. And then you'd be surprised how hard it is for people to understand things that I thought were so easy, like with your hands. Now there are certain checks I can't throw that others throw. Um, but my point is very simple. The biggest thing that gets hurt is your feet. Okay. So what we're going to do is we'll take a step back so you can see feet here, but my feet right there, Kaz, you're good. So my feet needs to need to continue to stay balanced as well as, as in an athletic position, my back, a lot of kids have the tendency to get their back foot forward. We still have to keep really good sound defensive position because we want to be in an athletic stance when we're throwing these checks. You know, a lot of these checks with the stick technology nowadays, you're going to have to really bring the check and it's going to have to be pretty violent to take the ball out. So you have to be in a good athletic stance to be strong, okay? To be strong to throw those checks with power. All right. Now that we've gone over that right there, let's get into some checks. I'm going to go so you guys are aware. All right. I'm going to, as a matter of fact, I am going to record this. All right. For myself. But what you're going to do, what we're going to do is we're going to go one check righty, one check lefty, one check righty, one, in case of time. All right. I'm going to cover some three, what I call bread and butters for your strong hand and three bread and butters for your weak hand. I won't use the terms righties and lefties because it's based on strong hand and weak hand for me. If I try to tell a lefty, say, when I say, all right, these are your strong hand, but I'm righty, a lefty, if you're trying to teach a kid, he gets confused. All right, so everything that I do with my strong hand, I'm right-handed, is the same thing that a lefty wants to do with his strong hand, okay? But I can do it righty, right? Because I'm a righty. I could throw most of them lefty as well, but I'm a strong handed righty guy. So I'm going to start with my favorite check. Let's just make sure Kaz is in there. Right here. Okay. So my, one of my, you're going to just like that, brother. I'm going to break you guy. It is called the, the drop. And then I'm going to turn Kaz around so you can see the front and the back side. So the drop is simple. Okay. Again, my feet are square. I'm a half step in front. One thing attackmen hate and all offensive guys hate, is when a stick becomes above their head. Because this doesn't allow, it disappears, okay? So this motion is very simple, but you guys will think it's, it's, it's going to be difficult because guys tend to snap and see it. So what I do is I just wave, 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 bang. And it's a simple check, all right? So I'll show you when it turn. don't worry. So what does all the work here, and you don't have to wave, okay? What does all the work here is my bottom hand does it, and then my bottom hand punches in and to the sky, okay? So if we turn Kaz so he can be in the camera, all right, this is what it looks like. So I'm here. I don't have to do anything. Now my stick's over here, and now it's in the middle. Now we're trying to time, right? We're aiming for in here, okay? In this day and age, attackmen don't flare their arms like they did in our day. So whatever went up usually came down. These guys nowadays, they run like this because they've gotten lazy with stick technology. So what I do is I'm here, I judge it, I wave, I time, and then I bang. I hit like that, all right? Now, I don't care if the ball didn't come out here because I, I don't want Kaz to be picking it up every single time here so we can get through these demos. But I'm here, 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 and then boom. So I don't want to go out here and then have him see it. It's just bang, you're down with it, okay? And the motion is simple. Okay, so you're here, it's bang, just that. That's all that is, guys. Nothing exciting. That check is probably the most effective check I've ever thrown uh, right-handed. It's not exciting, but it puts the ball on the floor. And in this day and age, our guys throw it, I mean, our guys hit it constantly. They're high school guys. They're elite high school guys at times, but they hit it on everybody. I mean, I'm still I'm 47 years old, obviously not in this most spectacular shape. And I play with college kids and I still hit it, you know, when I can run with a guy. <laughs> so the check is effective. It works. Now, what I, you need to do when you teach this check is you need to teach the kids to finish the check. So what will happen is when we do our check demos, these kids will just go 
they'll do this motion, right? You want to finish that check, right? And finishing check is, is finishing. So it's, it's finishing here. That's finishing the check. Have them reset. You don't have to wave. I'm a waver, right? It's boom down. Okay. All right. Now we'll turn that. That's called the drop. All right. That is for when you are on your strong hand. So for me, righty on righty. For lefties, lefty on lefty. Now we'll turn and play cross-handed, and we'll talk about the two-handed slap. All right? This is a cross-handed, weak-handed check for me. Kaz will go lefty, right, because I'm, uh, I'm righty. So we'll go on be the easiest way, probably right here, so they can see it from this distance. All right, so he knows enough. Kaz is smart enough to know that, like, I'm going to aim. Let's hold that for a second. I'm going to aim for here. I always aim for pocket, but he's going to put his hands down on purpose so I don't ding those thumbs up on him because I'm going to throw it a little bit different than maybe a lot of you guys are used to. This is where you have to unload it. You don't care. You're just throwing it in there, do you? That's why you're a G. So you're here. So now I'm going to bring it. Yep, I'm going to bring it here. I'm going to bring it back. Now, a lot of guys, when they throw a hack, I'm going to show you my feet after, but I throw it just like this. Okay? So if you look, I wasn't out of balance whatsoever when I threw that check, right? So you're here, it's here, right there. So now I'm gonna show you from a distance. Let me just move the camera so you can see my feet. I'm very lucky I have one of these tripod things. All right, so my feet, you watch out, okay, guys, you're good. When I throw that check, watch my hands. You don't need to see my face. It really, it's from my shoulders down is what you wanna watch. So when we throw this check, a lot of people, when they throw a, a big hack, it's really technically, I can throw a six inch to a 12 inch check and it'll be powerful enough to dislodge the ball and have snap because it's all about the way your hands finish, okay? And again, we talk about finishing the check, all right? So the biggest thing I do is when I bring it down, if I, I'm timing it, I'm not yanking it back. I'll show you in the next round of checks why I yank it back to set the guy up. But in this sense, I'm not yanking it back. I'm here. Running with them, running with them, trying to time it. And I'll show you what. So when I come down, a big hack is this. You try to cut through them. You see what happens to my feet, right? My feet get pounded and grounded in the ground. So you go here, and you go, as it comes down, you're throwing, and then this hand goes into this armpit. So what it does is as you're bringing all your momentum down, your hand balances your hip out. All right? That shouldn't – that. Just watch it again if you can. It's here. So it's here. Boom. Now I can bring Kaz in. I'll throw it with a little power, and I won't have to bring it far. Let me just adjust the camera so now you can see the whole thing, guys. All right. So we're here. My feet stay normal. I'm only about two feet, and I'm going to generate power here. Ready? That power right there. Okay, so it's here, boom, all right? So that's a two-handed slap. There's a difference, there's a two-handed, uh, I'll show you a, a one-handed slap versus, you know, in the next round uh, as well, but I'll show you counters to these now, all right? So now we're gonna go slide over to the right-hand side. Uh, by the way, before we go on, on those two checks, is there any quick questions? And if there's no quick questions, I'll move on. I'm not seeing anything yet, but uh, hey, if something pops in, I'll, I'll, I'll chime in for you. It's not a worry. Okay. So now we have the counter, okay, to the drop, which is the front kayak, all right? So Kaz is going to go righty. It's a strong-handed check again. So now I have him here. Now he's going to stand. Now there's a lot of things that operate here. You got to go with the step. Your hands have to slide. There's a lot of moving parts. A lot of kids don't understand how to finish the check, and they don't understand the way the hand goes. I'll try and break this down the best that I can on video. Okay, so Kaz, he's going to keep this away from his body so I don't hurt him. All right? He can pull it as far back as he wants. I'm still going to get to it. So I would be here. I drop it on his back. I step with my front foot. Now I have line of sight. I slide my hands up. And I come through, and then I throw. Okay? So don't worry about the ball. 
So we're here, so it works like this. All right. So if we're gonna break this down slow motion, it's the three pieces. It's step, hand slide up, throw. All right, so the distance of my hands is about eight inches from the top, and there's about another six inches in between my hands. My hands end up, my, the butt end ends up drawing, right, a little bit of a wave. So it draws a wave and then down. You don't throw up like this, that's a punch up. We'll show you that one on a two-handed guy later if we can get to it, right? But we, we would go here, I step, now my hand, see how it comes up? It draws that little wave and then I snap through. My hands make an X. Now how you teach kids is very simple, right? I throw that shit, sorry about that, G. All right, so when I throw, what I do is I say to kids, they can't understand. So I take it, I take their front hand, I get it to their spot, I make them step and then I make them grab. And then I just pull it out. I put it here. I make them just practice this motion. They step, this motion, right? So then when you put it all together, it's there, okay? That is the front kayak. How you practice it to know you're doing it right without a human in front of me is very simple. You can get a goal and if your butt end stabs because you technically got, are going to try and stab here so you get here even with it you step and stab see how my button gets caught okay the reason why you're stabbing Cass come on back for me my man is the reason why you're stabbing is when you come through here it goes all the way through and I want to finish that check way out here okay now in these check demos Sticks get annihilated, right? Because I'm throwing those checks as hard as I can, okay? Sticks are getting killed. So when you, if you want to teach a kid how to do this, teach them to you do it on an old stick. I mean, I am lucky, guys, right? A lot of us can get free stuff. I get the free sticks, so I'm good, okay? So the next check. So the counter, let's reiterate, the counter to the drop would be the front kayak, all right? Now we turn Kaz around. And now we throw the counter to the two-handed slap. So you would set the two-handed slap up. He pulls it back. And just get back there, Kaz. I'm going to slice you. So you go here. And then you bring it back from here. And then instead of jumping and going over, because if he tucks it, it's, you know, that, that song from NSYNC, Bye Bye Bye, right? He's got you. So what you do is you stay even with him again. And then all you're doing is throwing a check off his ear. You're slicing him in half. You're slicing this back shoulder. Now, it's real important, guys, that you realize you're supposed to land this here. There's, I don't care if the stick's way out here. For, you're really landing in margin of error. Okay? So I'm trying to get it here. I don't care if I break his shoulder. That's just his fault for playing offense. All right? It is. It's just it's how it works, man. Right? So I need that margin of error because if I go for stick here, if I want to hit stick and he tucks it, I get beat. I want to go to get it in margin of error. So I want to technically, I want to always throw checks into his shoulders to take away, you know, sticks. All right. So here it's, you're getting it here. You're here. I pull it back a little more so I don't get his shoulder. Please. So you're here, you bring it, bring it, and then you slice over. So you're coming down at his head and then off it. Now, what that does in real time, it, it scares you. Yeah. If we were doing this and this were the goal line extended, and Kaz is right on the goal line. So if we had the goal turned, and I'm throwing this, this is what it would look like. So he'd pull it back. I'd come here, right? I wouldn't really lose a ton of, you know, a ton because you're throwing it and stepping at the same time. All right. You're throwing and stepping at the same time, all right? So we have, we just did the counter to the uh, drop was the kayak on the strong hand for guys. And then the counter to weak handed was the, of the two handed slap was the slicer, all right? So now we'll go and talk about, uh, on the right hand, we'll go strong side and we'll talk about the over the head, all right?
So everybody knows an over the head. It can be thrown a million different ways. Some guys punch to the sky. Some guys time it. Some guys just throw their stick over. I do a little bit of both. Sometimes I'll just throw a stick over to set up a ding dong. But an over the head for me, I get up and down. Even in Kaz's 6'2", I still would try to get up and over as quick as I can. You know, that's one thing I always could able to do. That's one of so the three checks that I'm giving you right now are the three that we're first starting out with are the three bread and butters that I made a living off of, but I also think can dislodge the ball in this day and age. Okay. So now this is very difficult to teach in like a slow motion scenario. So we'll do it in slow-mo and then I'll just kind of like Kaz jog and I'll reach over and, and throw a check. Maybe I make it, maybe I don't. I might blow a hamstring out. Who the hell knows, guys? So I'm here. So what I do, and that would just get you that way, I can see perfect. I'm a half step in front still always, right? Good position, right? I have to close the gap. I, I go here, I punch to the sky, and then I get down. Now, guys, you notice where the head's aiming? It's not aiming here. It's aiming to tear arm again, all right? So you have to get ballistic here, up, down, and rip through. So Because if you go for stick and it's out there and he tucks it, it's see you later, okay? So we want to go up and down. Now, this is a hold. It's going to be a battle of battle. So if a guy's in there battling with you, and he, you want to let go and then rip that way. Okay? Or if he goes to the floor and you take him down, you got to let go of your stick. And I just honestly, I just smack it stick to try and get the legal procedure and stop the play. All right? But usually that sends a pretty good message to an attackman that, like, he's in for a long day. Okay? So now we just went over the head. So now we'll go back to lefty. All right, so now, by the way, the only reason I'm jumping back and forth is because if I get into all the righty checks, we could be here a while, and then I won't be able to get to all the lefties. So I'm kind of giving you one for one, if that's okay, out there in viewer land, all right? So that being said, we want to throw the back yak, okay? So the back yak, I'll show you where I would throw it, but right now, for all intents and purposes, the back yak is when a guy, you throw it, he brings it back, and you throw that over his shoulder, okay? So you would fake the, the, the slap, step, and throw over the shoulder. Now, where that works, this is a very risky check, but when you hit it, it's very much glory. So Kaz would go here, and then he, I'd let him get the corner. He'd turn the corner, and I'd just jump. Even if he was over here, I'd jump and hit it. Now, what happens there? You get an attackman like who's smooth with two hands. He gets that and he goes with the check, and that dude scores on you. You hope not, but what happens a lot is that you get enough to where you actually de-stick him because it comes off his hands. Now the counter to that one, I'll give you another one since we're here. It's quick. Is if he's a two-handed guy, right? He's a big leaner and he's two-handed. He's in like John Grant. John Grant, this was actually a great check on John Grant. Of, of all people, John Grant, who's as, as legit as they come, I would call it the butt up because it's tough for guys to see. So you see it here. You get here, you get here, and then you throw up like that. All right? And a lot of you guys are going, well, Jesus, like what the hell's that? that? Fellas, I'm going to look at you dead in the camera and tell you that if you don't get creative with what you're doing, and understand how to be creative and have fun with it, you can't ever strip the guy. So those types of things, like I'll just, I'll show you a butt rip in about two seconds that like no one will really ever see coming. But the butt up is a way to get a guy who's a leaner, right? And you got a guy, he's lean on leaner, and you want to get a check, you want to get a check, you hear you got enough strength, shot, bang, and just hit that up, okay? All right, so now we'll give you the butt rip. I'm burning my hands from the shaft. It's amazing. All right. So the butt rip is simple. So he's a two-handed cradle guy, right? You just right there. That much butt. That's a pretty in like you don't realize it's like legit this check because you don't see it. You're running with him. He's got two hands on the stick. You just here. And then that that you got to do it fast to rip. And then if he lets go with his stick and he's here, then you want to follow down with a chop. All right. So we have the butt up. We have the butt rip. 
That's for when you're going to averse a guy with your weak hand. Okay. Uh, I just want to make sure I'm hitting the essential one. Going righty, strong hand for me. The ding dong can throw it three different ways. All right. You can do it where you tap, tap, tap. So it's tap, tap, up, down. You can do where it's you go up and throw and then you punch through, or you can just do straight up and down. All right. The difference with that and the and the drop is the drop you're timing hitting in. The, 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 you're literally throwing, trying to, to, to decoy him to give you this, okay? To give you this. If we do it from this way, Kaz go ready, we'll give him a different angle. No, there we go. So I'll get a distance. I'm moving you, sorry. She got here, right? So I would go, I'm here. That's how I throw. So I go up and then come down through, okay? So you, right there, you have the, uh, the ding dong. Any questions? I see a Q and A right there. I can't read it unless I touch it. I'm yeah, assuming. Yeah, it's okay. No, it was. Uh, what are the thoughts on the V hold versus a cross check on a driving attackman? Okay, so there's a, that's a great question, and it's no problem. We'll veer off it. I absolutely love that question. First of all, thank you for that, because that is extremely important. Okay, so a V hold in this day and age, everybody, if you're a coach, I sure hope you're teaching it right. Because in my era, we taught the V-hole. Because the V-hole was something big. That was, you know, what we did. You V-holded on a guy that went right-handed in the 90s, right? You're under his arm. So there's a time for both. Now, in this modern game that we have, they do a lot of cross-check, right? Hands away from your body, athletic-type holds. But the V-hold is really important. So let me turn the goal. So I'm, I'm holding Kaz righty because I'm righty. There we are. Sorry, guys. At least we're at least we got all this fancy dancy technology. We can do this, right? All right. So, Kaz will stay here. So now, if I was playing Kaz, because Kaz is a bigger guy, I would V hold him righty, because this right here, if he leans, he breaks my shaft. He's big and strong enough to break the shaft, because he's what are you like two sixty five something like that, two eighty. I was trying to make you happy, right? Camera added thirty pounds to me, so don't worry. <laughs> So, but a proper V hold, I want you to watch my feet. This is where coaches forget that this is the most important thing about a V hold is where your feet are. Okay. This. All right. So, if we could see my feet. So, now I'm going to hold calf. Turn, there it is. Let's turn you this way. There it is. Okay. So, my feet are square. If this if it was, I was holding calf right above the goal on extended here because we have the goal it's actually the goal on extended right here all right i would number one the importance of a v-hole the biggest important thing you gotta do with v-hole is get under the arm that's huge because if you have shitty feet and i'll show you what bad feet are at least you're underneath controlling his inside roll and controlling a part of his body with leverage okay and controlling a part that he needs to score goals typically which is another arm so you drop and you're here. Now, there's a bunch of guys like Notre Dame. They teach that guy hand on their hip always, okay? That's those guys, all right? Nothing wrong with that. You coaches out there that teach that, that's awesome. I have no problem with that, okay? I teach just to have comfortable hands. And then when I lock up, my hand automatically goes into my hip, right? It's not, it doesn't matter up or down. I've seen the debates. To be honest with you, it's just because the way the stick is offset, it just sits like that for me. I really don't care back. When sticks weren't offset, I believe it was like this for me. Um, I think that's the way the pictures were. But I'm just like this with a V-hold, all right? So what we do is I lock my hand into my hip. Now Cass can lean on me. All right, now. Now, he can lean on me, Cass. It's good. So I'm holding Cass. Now I'm, I'm about 245. And Cass has got that leverage in, right on me. But I'm, I'm, I'm sustaining it with ease, not struggling talking to you. But if I were to get above his shoulder, now he leans on me. It's, it's now it's a true battle. Okay. So the key is to get under the arm. Number one, because low man wins. Number two, why you want to is because a lot of coaches don't fix feet. Okay. You want your feet to be at minimum square, which is taking away top side, but this is square. You have to draw a line in the sand 
that comes off and a diagonal that says you can't come beyond this point. No, no, no. Problem is too many guys take their feet and they put their back foot forward. And if Cass takes me high enough, don't take me high enough, and then I'm here fighting the inside roll, sticks his arm out, I got no drop step because my back foot here, right, is gone. So he rolls me, I have no, and I'm doing this, or I'm doing this, right? So, I mean, obviously, that, we would be on the goal and extended before he went inside roll. He's good enough to attack me, I know that. So what I do, what I taught myself, okay, was to go front foot forward. So to take my feet from being what is square, okay, to being front foot forward. So now I have a good base of power as it is. It's the same power. And then I call it establishing front foot dominance. So I say, here's my over the top. Now this was before they used to talk about taking the top side away. It, I, I just, I just knew to stagger my feet. And the reason why I did is because we would do a, a drill called the drop step and punch through. It's a very old school drill, but it's a very useful drill that no one teaches. And I'll teach you it in one second. So Kaz would take me. And if I have his arm, number one, he's got to get his arm out. Okay. But if he gets his arm out and the inside rolls, I drop step and I punch through. So if you just stay over there, Kaz, it's this movement. Get you here. It's this hand follows this foot. So I take myself from this hand being on his upfield hip to this hand being on his backfield hip when he turns. So I trail his back hip. And what it looks like is you get him above the goal line, he rolls, you're here, and then you ride him away, and then you reset yourself with a big hack behind the goal. All right? That right there is effective for guys who are big right-handed top side guys. Okay? All right, big, you know, leaners that will bully you, all right? Now, on the flip side, the cross check hold, right, with your stick behind is where you've got to drop your hips and try and get your butt to the opposite sideline, right? So I'll show you when we go right, when I go lefty. But if you're doing it on a righty, the only disadvantage you have here is a lot of kids tend, when they get here, they, they tend to have their body, their face, fall to the back shoulder. What I've learned about holds is your head controls everything. Your coaches scream, your feet and your hips. Dude, it's very simple to get back in front of a guy. So if I'm over here, right, so let's get the camera so you can see my face. There's two things, right? Your chin controls everything. So if I'm here on Kaz, right, it's a battle. All of a sudden he's in me right? Or I'm running with him here. I'm behind him. Because my head's... All I tell guys to do is shh, just get your head in front. When you do that, you see what that does? That shifts you right in front of his body. So now how you set up that hold, all right? I wouldn't hold this way here, personally. I really don't... Guys don't get to the goal line extended much on me, truth be told. But I'm always a, a here and then hands. But I usually just take an arm away. You can kind of just run with a guy they know. All right, but now if we shift it to the left side, okay, where I'm cross-handed, there we go. Wow, this tripod worked for me, huh? So if we're now on the left side, you talk about a cross-check hold. Now, on the right side, by the way, I forgot to reiterate why I said there's both is needed is because I tell guys to trail in the scouting report when you have a lefty because he's an inside roller or question mark. So I have those guys play with their sticks behind to defend that. So it really depends on your matchup. Okay, I hope I'm answering this correctly because in my brain it sounds so perfectly fine. All right, so now here there's three different types of, of holds. All right, there's a butt fist, which is I stick it here into his pit. I can't physically control a guy this big, even a guy 190. All right, that's my that's my tricep versus his whole body. All right, then there's a front fist, which is now one side of my body, and my tricep and chest versus his whole body. So what I do is I try to get two hands here, get myself upfield, keep my chin up and up on his upfield shoulder, right? Again, my chin, we don't want back here. And I'll tell you what you do if you get caught here. It's a very simple fix. He's going to laugh because he's, he's seen this a thousand times, 
right? So I just want to readjust my chin. Now, if I have a, a kid and he's dying like this and he puts his head down, really all you need to do is tell him to lift his chin up. So a lot of guys will push a guy out and there's a big fight. And I, I'll be like, and then all of a sudden, say cast fades. I fall forward, I'm on my ass, all right? So all you do to fix that, okay, is he's here, and then he, you just lift your chin up. Because when you lift your chin up, it drags your hips back to be in an, in an athletic position. You sit, right? Instead of being forward, just lift your chin up, all right? Now, the way I hold, if I can, is I try to, I try to hook arm and then control. So I try to get here and then lock. So that way I'm underneath, and then I try to leverage and, and move. I try to keep him and move him out, all right? So uh, let me just show you when we get stuck up, when you get stuck in a sticking point, what I teach my guys to do is when they get up in me, okay, they get up in me, I tell them to take a shit on their heels, all right? So let's move back, all right? Let this go, all right? I tell them to take a shit on their heels. So now he's into me. I'm fighting like a bastard, right? My head's behind. I'm sooner or later just going to be in a terrible position. Everything's forward. I tell them to take a shit on their heels and step back, right? So guys don't realize that you're giving up ground to, with your feet, but not giving up any ground. So if I'm here with Kaz, we're our battle, and then I, I rebalance myself, okay? So I call it taking a shit on your heels. You step back, then shit on yourself, all right? So that's what I do, what I teach. Um, and the drop, step, and punch through drill is very simple. Okay, so if Kaz is right here, if we go on a line, I put my feet square on a line, go righty, Kaz. So I, take, I find a sideline, put my feet square so the kid gets used to it. I put my hand on her, and all he does is take one step and roll, stands there, and I drop, step, and punch through. Okay, so what that does, if we can get back, we'll see the, show you the feet. So what that does, so all you're going to do is take one step for me, Kaz. So you just take, you take a step. And now I'm, a late, I'm late there. Don't move. I'm late, but I'm going to show you now what I do. So at the same time, I'm drop stepping and punching through. Now why I stagger with my back foot, right, and hold is when he rolls, all I'm doing is flailing my hip open. This foot flails. I don't have to take a big drop step. I'm already keeping him inside my body, all right? So I hope that answers your question on holds. Yeah. Anything else? There's four. Yeah, we got some good ones here. So um, let me start with this one. If or Where on the field do you want guys throwing more or less checks? So behind the goal, that's a great question. Behind the goal, I didn't want to waste too much time about it, but this is the best spot to throw checks, and it's the worst spot. It's this V right here. Right in here. The guy's decided he's going to the goal. So in this area is the best spot. Now, what I teach my guys to do is when a guy retreats as well. So if I'm guarding Kaz and he all of a sudden retreats now, I retreat with him. And that's when I start to carve him up because I want to get him to where he's in a defensive position. And now he, I, you know, because when he retreats, he's number one had enough. Okay, two things have happened. He's had enough, he's tired, or he wants to move the ball. So when I've done all that work, being in front of him, being you know, under his hands, doing all that work that the D guys do, like, why would I let him now get rest? Because I can become proactive. See, what I teach my defensemen the best that I can, guys, is I really do teach them to be proactive people. I don't try to be reactive. As a defenseman, we are reactive, okay? That's the problem. See, we don't make it simple. It's very simple. If I want to guard Kaz, he starts out with his back to you. No, you're back to the camera. Okay, Kaz is righty. You can't see me, guys. Not because Kaz is a mountain of a man. That's true, you are. I'm giving Kaz a choice. So why would I give him a choice? That means I have to be reactive, guys. Why would I give him a choice? So too many guys give choices. Now, behind the goal, I tell my guys to squeeze, meaning you squeeze in the pipes, right? I don't call it over the top. I call it squeeze. Keep them between the pipes. Above the goal extent, I tell them to push down the alleys, right? Because as, you know, shot, shot 
angle decreases, say percentage increases. But when I start out on somebody, I take a side. Like I legitimately am really taking a side here on Cass. All right. You have to make a, a, an undisputed decision to not be reactive. You need to be proactive. So most of the time I tell my guys to just get to a spot that you feel comfortable. And it could be that guy has no left hand, which Kaz is actually excellent with both hands. Um, I, I, Kaz, I would, just, I would just put him to a spot because I want him to get moving so I'm reactive. I, 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 I'm proactive. I don't have to deal with him back and forth. So – I would break the field and I would break what he does. I would cut his value of his game in half. So if I wanted him to go righty, I'd start here, way over here in this part of the camera. You don't see. All right. I would, my stick's on his back. You can see that. I want him to go that way. Okay. So too many of you guys, and this is, this is the truth. I'm not trying to be arrogant. And again, I'm not perfect, but I can tell you, that what we do at CBA, at least with the defensemen that we get for that some period of time, is that we are able to take what we have and maximize it with intelligence. And they're pretty lucky I'm a D guy, right? So that's, I try to break stuff down simple. So we always approach to with a purpose. So we always approach to be proactive. We don't ever let a guy, you know, take us in the corner and just we, then we drop in. We pounce when he's going away. When there's an invert, my middies don't just let the guy run to the invert. They force the dodge right away. Because why would we let people set up? We would have to be moronic. That's the problem. We are moronic most of the time on defense. All right? You have to understand, it's very easy. This is not brain surgery. You just have to start to think outside the box. Does that make sense? There's more questions. Fire yeah, away. Yeah. No. So if you get beat after missing with a check, do you coach the trail mm -hmm. check? And what are the teaching points? So the teaching point, very simple. If I get beat, that's a great question too. Let's put that camera. Because number oh, number one, let's just face it, guys. I don't get beat. <laughs> yeah, Kaz laughed at that one. Because at my age, I still play with the young bucks and I guys get steps. But what I call it, and I was brought up that question today. It's a great question. I know there's, these are great questions. And I'm not saying it to be nice. Trust me. I'd tell you to go F off. Like, if it was a bad question. I'm pretty straightforward. But I call it non-panic defense. Okay? So the strategy is simple. If I have Kaz and he gets top side, and he's beating me here. Or he's getting top side. So if I'm behind him, I teach my guys two things. First thing is I teach him stick it under a hand, take an arm away, make him shoot through your stick. Okay. So Cass has got me legitimately beat. I don't know if you can see this. I mean, we're at a different angle here, but I'm six foot. I'm more than eight feet beat here. Okay. Good. He's literally in front of me. Okay. So now when Cass goes to shoot, I, right, that's it. That's all I did. Right. I try to get him to shoot. I try to get him to shoot through my stick. If he scores with one hand on a stick, great. I'm already beat. I might as well take a hand away. Okay. So now the second thing I do, and a lot of guys don't do, is a lot of guys will, they do this. They trail out here. So I'll tra guys will trail here. Dude, Kaz knows this is coming. He thinks, yo, you can't see me. What I do is I trail in the middle of his body. So then wherever he goes, I can go here. If he brings it in front, I can go here. Right? So you have to call it non-panic defense is what I call it. So too many guys panic. All right? So if you miss it, by the way, if you missed an over the head check, you're screwed, right? Let's be honest, because we said before, the best place to throw an over the head is right here, okay? You're screwed. But if you throw a, a drop and miss it, and then the guy gets a step, and you just take an arm away, you're not screwed. See, there's a difference between really getting smoked and being beat and then countering to that. Does that make sense? I call it non-panic defense, guys. Yeah, that um, makes complete sense to me. Now, if you're a righty defenseman, you got to stop a lefty drive. I know you don't mm -hmm. switch hands, but is that the time for a cross check? Mm -hmm. Always. The cross checks all over the field. I actually teach the, the K through. You'd be proud of me, all you Canadians. I teach a cross check to Americans, like 
to my little guys because I want to encourage violence. This is a violent sport. The only difference is, so as all the Canadian box guys know, when I cross-check Kaz, I don't want to cross-check him here. That's going to get called. I want to cross-check, we call it cross-check his pockets, not his waistband because a lot of guys can't get, they, they don't get low enough. So with a cross-check, I want to break that, that pocket, right? I don't want to be here. So to answer your question, when a guy goes across, yes, I don't switch hands at all. Because why would you switch hands if you're not accustomed to it? So like Colgate a bunch of years ago with Mike Murphy and, uh, and uh, Joe Stargia was the defensive coordinator, Dom's um, coach Stargia's son. He used to teach the guys he wanted to play cross-handed always, which I understand. That's excellent. Hands are off your body and everything. But if you're recruited in high school as a righty, and then all of a sudden you're playing high-level Division One, and you have to learn how to play lefty against a righty, like, it's kind of impossible, at least to learn. I mean, you can. I know how to play lefty, but it is not nearly as good as when I play righty. So I don't switch hands. I don't, you know, I can hold lefty. I can hold with a trail. I try not to. The only time I switch hands is when I'm off ball or I'm in a fast break where I have to play, where it's, you know, it's, it's bringing down sticks in a lane and then coming down on your hands. But, yes, you always go with a cross check. So when he comes lefty for me, I'd be here bang. Now, Jerry Byrne. At Notre Dame, guys, this is important. I can teach you this. He, he calls it a violent collision. And what he does is very simple. He throws his entire – these kids throw their face into the shoulder. Now, why do they do that? You're saying, boy, he comes off balance. That's the purpose. It's for him to make a violent collision, move you off, and then because I made the collision defensively, I'm going to recover quicker. So that's the concept there. So he calls it a violent collision. They have a good uh, channel, the old school ones. I don't know if, uh, if um, Jerry has his Harvard stuff, but those are where I used to say make a violent collision on, on guys on the corner. Um, and you know who did that really well, guys, was Matt Landis, if you watch him play from the Redwoods uh, Lacrosse Club in the PLL. So there's a, it was actually a pretty good comment. Just, do you have any uh, highlight tapes of your Syracuse days? Uh. They have them on Betamax. <laughs> okay. Because they were asking if there was highlight tapes. Uh, you know what? There's games on YouTube. What? In your garage. There's games on YouTube, uh, you know, from the 90s, 92, 93, 94, 95. Um, if you want to see really good takeaway artists, you don't have to really even look for the 4-7. You want to look for Chad Smith and Hodge Smith, who I played with in 90, uh, 94 and 95. They were both second team All Americans. I don't know why I was the first teamer, guys. Uh, they were good. I got taken to the crease a lot that year, so they. I was so jealous. They got to rip guys, and they were damn good at it. Uh, so I mean, that's and also like my stuff that the checks I have are available. I have a YouTube channel. I don't need you to go there. I don't need to get followers. Uh, it's called Upstate Lacrosse Club. I used to have a club. Um, it's on my Instagram. My Instagram is Rick, R-I-C Beardsley, B-E-A-R-D-S-L-E-Y. Um, you can email me at Rick, R-I-C at mercuryprinting.net if you have any questions, but, uh, or you want to see checks. I have videos. I sent them to the Atlas guys today as a joke. I posted some online. I'm actually doing a tomorrow, believe it or not, I am doing a takeaway summit on zoom. It's sold out in, oh my God, like, yeah, day and a half, pretty much. Uh, I got, that's all I had was 99 people I could handle on zoom. So I, I filled it with 98 and I'm the 99. Um, so tomorrow I'll do the same thing with my boy Kaz, but, uh, you know, with just checks for an hour, um, any more questions you tell me now, nah, it was just some good comments. Great stuff. Takeaway checks are fun for the defense. I mean, when I was in school, this is, uh, you had just finished and that, that was still, that was still a big thing. Like, Defense is well, we have to, yeah, we have because the system came in. So there's no like I was telling the guys at the Atlas guys. So my my job with with the PLL is simple. I'm a defensive coordinator for the Atlas, and my biggest thing was, and I don't even know if I'm right or wrong, but I think I'm right. Is that why would we complicate things? Too many guys I found when you ask a defensive coordinator in Division One, Two, or Three, they want to have an answer and they want to have some fancy answer. There's no fancy answer. Like, it's still about winning your matchup, having a good strategy within that one-on-one, -on -one, 
and then having a solid game plan behind that, right? So it's different than offenses. Defenses, offenses start in a set and they get creative and they can do a million things off that. It's all freelance. Defense has to abide by certain rules of that in order to stop those things because it can morph and freelance. And the only way to beat a freelance is to stay disciplined to rules. Like if it's a pick on the outside, on the wing, what do you do with the pick? My rule is put, your, put the pick guy underneath. Or it's also don't even let the pick happen. Start jamming the guy before he get make it difficult for him to get to the pick. So that's what like the types of things that we think about that now, by the way, as coaches, we have to like, let's be honest, we coach people. They don't listen all the time and they're not perfect, let alone high school kids or people who just started. But if you try to look at the philosophy to make it seem like you're being proactive versus reactive. That's the problem. We like this shirt says make defense great again. It's my hilarious, you know, line, you know, <laughs> it's a spoof on the Donald Trump hat, right. For the Americans. But like my thing is like you commented before, th- takeaway checks are fun. This position should be fun. Mm-hmm. We do the meat and potato drills. They suck. I tell my guys every day, by the way, guys, Practice sucks for a D guy, an individual, because you're doing approaches, footwork, uh, holds, patterns. Like, I practice patterns like a cornerback does with an NFL in the NFL. Like, I practice if an attackman goes, you know, split left, right, we have guys doing here split left, right. Getting muscle memory, understanding when they need to explode, and understanding how to defend a pattern. All right, so – yeah. I try to think outside the box. Is that always right? No. There's three more questions. Fire away. Yeah, I'm here so all night. I'm coach, here all night, fellas. Let us know. How, how can they find out when you're doing your Zoom calls? My, everything's typically posted on my Instagram, okay. which is, like I said, R-I-C-B-E-A-R-D-S-L-E-Y. Right? Um, I got uh, my boy Callum Robinson from Australia going on uh, tomorrow with Kaz. He's up for five in the morning. Um, I have guys from all over the country. And I also do – you know, Zoom clinics for the younger kids, which are interactive, right? So yeah. I'm doing 30 kids and I'm scrolling through, checking their drills, making them do I do it right in my driveway because we are in a pandemic, but also, not, I mean, we're, I'm lucky. I have a facility my buddy owns here in the back of a building that he put turf in. And the only reason I'm doing that, guys, is because so, like some of you, it's dark out. I don't have, we can't flip on lights in a pandemic on our turf field. We'll be arrested. If this was no pandemic, Kaz and I would be on a field. It'd be lit. We'd have nice breeze it'd be great but that's what we're doing so that's where you can find the access to all that but also like i said the checks and everything are sitting right in that instagram page just scroll down i literally put on what i put 12 checks on there uh and 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 i just put like i just put a couple up just to kind of get people who are on tomorrow used to what i'm going to be doing tomorrow yep so I know great. I'm going to read this one verbatim because you'll yeah, appreciate go ahead. great session. You need to do more great information, delivery, no BS. And you get to the point. I try to, and I appreciate that. I know I sound like, like when I'm on the ACC network calling these games, I get killed on Twitter because I'm just an average Joe. I don't have like the pretty voice. I sound like I'm a guy talking to you in a bar because that's the way I want to look at lacrosse. This is a simple sport guys. You have to start as defensive coaches thinking outside the box because we always use we always use this phrase offense wins games defense wins championships so why the fuck don't we concentrate on defense as much as we concentrate on offense yeah uh, rick great job thanks for the presentation um all good do i have another question where's the other question i got three of them come they're on compliments. Them away. they're compliments okay i'm just making sure tommy Pryor. oh my god tommy Pryor's on yep yeah. Holy Jesus. All the way in dirty jerseys. That's my boy. <laughs> uh, you didn't realize an OTP. That's my guy right there. Uh, awesome. Right. Okay. There, is there more? Jesus. There's four now. Okay. Yeah. Oh, there the we go. Best attackman I ever played. The toughest attackman I ever played against. Uh, oh, let me take close this. Toughest attackman I ever played against. Do you really want to know? You may not know him. Uh, I'll give you uh, a few things. In practice at Syracuse, practice was harder than the games. When we got to games, it was a joke. Nothing against the attackmen I played against. There were some great ones. But I played against, in my four years at Syracuse, I came in and played against Tom Marachek. He was, right, the 
attackman yeah. of the year. He was on our attack. He's in the Hall of Fame. My sophomore year, Matt Ryder was the attackman of the year. He was on our attack. Guarded him every day. Midfielder of the year, Dom Finn, 94. I guarded him every day. Roy Colsey, same thing, midfielder of the year in 95. Um, but my, my toughest matchup was probably – you're going to laugh. Jimmy Morrissey, who's the head coach at St. Rose in Albany, yeah, yeah. was probably my toughest matchup just because here's the problem, guys, and it's a problem. Everybody knows your checks. So, they like, I would get in games and freak out because some slob would strip Mojo, and I'd go nuts. I'd be like, dude, I can't strip you. I'm 700 times better than that guy. But you, you get stripped by this frigging pig from Holy Cross? Are you out of your mind? Like, really? Like, how does he strip you and I can't? Is because we knew each other's tendency. So practice, to answer your question, practice was a lot harder than games were. Now, the guy I played against who was excellent, uh, was, you know, he didn't really give me nightmares at all uh, in, in college was Mark Millen. You know, we all know Mark Millen. He's one of the best ever. Um, you know, I, I had a really good go at it with him. There's the guy. Joe, got it. I found it. came to my mind. Joe Matassa from Duke. Only guy who's ever crossed my feet up behind the goal in my entire life. How about that? Crossed my feet up, and then, I'm not going to lie to you, I stripped him every other time, but he crossed my feet up that one time. <laughs> um, are there any checks you don't throw anymore due to stick technology? Yes. The one-handed wrap, which is just that, you know, guys throw a one-handed wrap like this. I throw a one-hand slap where you throw it, you snap it, so it comes like this. You go here, so it's a one. Hand, this is a one hand wrap. It, that's that's weak and booty, right? I, you throw your hands. You throw your hands. I throw a one handed uh, slap, and also it's a back wrap. It's a one handed back slap, right? So that's one I don't really try to throw anymore. Um, but you know, it, at times you you can throw them. Uh, what else is another one? The butt dig. All those just back doesn't, Wheatley doesn't practices work. were harder. Yeah, the, the, the butt dig doesn't work anymore. I mean, you really got to crush a guy's hands to get out of his stick. I got to. Um, but those two, yeah. All those Beck and Wheatley practices were harder. Yeah. Oh, yeah, the Beck and Wheatley. Absolutely, they were. Who's, uh, who's saying that? Tommy Pryor. Tommy Pryor. I, I, Beck and Wheatley was tough. I mean, that's old school Westchester County. Pryor knows, right over the river. Yeah. And any takeaway stick checks for box lacrosse? Takeaway stick checks for box cross, honestly. <laughs> I used to go like over the head once in a while, uh, you know, but you really got to crawl on a guy. But box lacrosse players, you just want to rail hands, beat up hands, swing, you know, use that one handed, you know. But I don't need, are there rules in box anymore, man? It seems like it's, it's all out guerrilla warfare. But I, I personally would stay away um, from throwing any checks in box. It's just a, a big cross check, slap, cross check, slap, cross chip hack. Maybe throw a butt end every once in a blue moon, but I really, I when I played, which yeah. was very limited due to just traveling, you know, living and not being able to afford it. I just, I really, you know, I only threw like an over the head once in a blue moon when I was really athletic and young. Yeah, there's not a there's not a whole heck of a lot of takeaway nope. stick checks. It's more no nope. relying on doubles and and you know yep. beating a guy up additional stuff. So yep, yeah. Um, do you like all the new visors for D men? You can't see where they're looking. Uh, you know what? I, I it, it, to me, it's six to one, half dozen the other. I, I mean, I don't know. It, it, I, I never looked in anybody's eyes. Um, you know, I don't. It's not like a quarterback where I'm reading their eyes. So for me personally, having a visor did me anything. I mean, honestly, if a guy had a visor versus me, I'd call him a douche. But like, I would just do that. To, I would do that to get under his skin because that was big for me. The mental part of the game. I, I, I mean, I was. I'm probably not the most well-liked guy on a field because I, I only – I tried to play and create a violence and create an anger uh, in order to take me to a different place when I played. So I, 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 that sounds sick maybe to most people. But, like, I don't even play in our men's leagues anymore with the old guys because until the playoffs because I, I, I create – I try to create violence. So I can only play – in a very in a different state of mind. I know it sounds I, weird I to a lot a of you. friend of mine. We were talking about you because I told him you were coming yeah. on, and I said, uh, I said, you know, I don't remember playing a lot against him other than the NLL. I said, but from from my old roommate, he was the guy that you wanted on your team and not playing against. 
Yeah, I mean, I tried, you know, I, yeah. I was always taught, you know, we grew up in, you know, in a part of New York where it was, you know, we were, you know, you, you had to fight for yourself. And, yeah. you know, that's, that's the way we try to now. I mean, this is a violent sport, guys. It is a controlled violent sport. Colleges want violent defensemen. Don't ever let them kid you. Um, I'm not asking you to be cheap. I wasn't cheap, but I brought it from the heels on a ground ball, you know, and I tested the refs because I came from a father who was an official. And he always said, try to bend the rules as much as you can. So I tried to bend the rules. I did it my whole career. Um, but, yeah, that's, that was, you know, that, that's just the way I, I have an attitude. I still am, a, as you can tell, I'm, I'm a pretty, in, you know, I'm here at, you know, 903 in the middle of New York, in upstate New York. I'm, I'm, pretty, in, I'm a pretty intense person in a lot of ways, and, and I don't know how to change it. Um, so I kind of limit myself, you know. So any, any specific heads and shafts you recommend for kids? So it depends on age. This game costs a lot of money, right? Like I know, I sell it, right? I sell equipment. I sell uniforms. I, I, I'm, I'm about to sell to Tom Pryor and Don Bosco. He just doesn't know it yet now that he's on here. But uh, I legitimately, for me, like defensively, there's two heads that I like. Uh, and, I, and I like them really because – the ball gets off the floor. It's this Maverick uh, Havoc, all right, um, that I have on here. And then also the epic defensive head is very good. Um, as far as shafts, I, I really do enjoy this Dragonfly. I mean, they gave it to me for free. I have a gold one in the car. I really, I, I really do. I, I like the way it feels. It's light enough. Um, but you have to make sure – that your technology lasts. But if you're a young kid and you have just, you have limited funds, I mean, you know, anything goes. I think I didn't believe in the stick technology a couple of years ago. Casa left because he strings sticks and that's his thing. I used to say, put it, you can put a piece of dog shit on, on my head. I'd still be an all American. I've seen how technology, it sounds terrible, right? But I've seen how technology has changed. So like this head right here gets the ball off the floor in second. Like if I was a box guy, a two-handed offensive player, I'd use this – I would use this head because it's shaped like – I mean, it's perfect, okay? So it really depends on, like, you know, age. If you're a young guy and you, you, know, and you have young kids, just cut the head so it's, you know, about an inch and a half above your, your child's head. And then, you know, when a kid gets strong enough to listen, to hold one of these, a, a pure six-footer, then go with the pure six-footer. But I like the Epic products. A lot in the shafts. Um, STX makes a, a deep hole that lasts forever, the side tie. It's a little heavy for me. But these, this epic dragonfly is what I'm going with right now. And then I have a tactic head. And then Kaz is stringing me up the epic head. But I don't know if I'm going to vary off, off this. I like this too much. And then I go with, I don't know, Kaz has a special mesh that he uses. I don't know what it's called. But it's at, at String Empire. He just strung this for me. It's actually legit. Uh, first time I've used it. Two more questions for you, and then we'll uh, we'll call it. Fire our... away, yeah, 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 whatever. So how important was and is goalie communication to your game and style? It is huge. I was talking with Jack Kincannon this morning, as a matter of fact, trying to set the basis of a of a of a conference call I have to do with the Atlas guys every Thursday. We do it every other Thursday. So last week was offense. This Thursday, I have to whiteboard defense. So I was talking with Jack. And Jack is, is primarily a very quiet goalie. He's one of the best in the world, obviously, Team USA kid. And I needed to have him understand the importance of communication. So the four things I, I listen for only on a field, me personally. Like, I listen for where ball location is, all right, because that tells me where it is. Especially if I'm on the crease, that tells me, should I play ball sides so I front so I don't get popped out on? Uh, second is check. So I can, you know, I know if I'm inside, hands, you know, to rip through hands. Also, you know, there's a pass. So if I hear check somewhere and I'm, I'm turning off ball and I'm on a pipe, I know there's a pass going inside somewhere. Uh, also, so it turns my head to the ball. Um, I listen for uh, clear, right? Goalie makes a save. I could be my head turned here, clear, take off. Um, and the other big thing is I listen for – uh, and it's primarily not from the goalies. It's just uh, you know, who the slide package is, you know, who's my one, who's my two. 
Yeah. Uh, but goalie communication, I am one of those guys that I'll be in a game, and when I get on the crease initially or, or I settle in and transition, like if the ball comes down the side in a slow break, for example, just the way I think, is that like I don't want to create – I'm over here, but I don't – the reason I'm in here is just to show you. I don't want to create offense. So what happens is too many guys' ball comes down the side here, and the ball could go behind. Now, behind me, there's a lot of shit coming and happening. There's guys funneling, taking cuts. Why would I vacate a spot and go play the ball behind when it's unsettled? So what I do a lot is I'll ask the goalie because I can't see. I'll be like, hey, can I go? Are we set on the backside here? Because I could vacate, and there could have been a guy cutting and the guy didn't hear. Because so, remember, I have to turn and watch the ball and get my stick to the lane. So in transition, I make the goalies talk to me a lot. Like if I don't know where the ball is, I say, hey, goalie, I can't hear you. Can you tell me the ball is? Also, a big thing is fast breaks. Talk to your goalie about fast breaks, how high he wants it, like, you know, how high you want to be. Like real good goalies like in Cannon, you, you don't, I wouldn't slide till it's 10 yards. But you get shitty goalies, you got to pick up at 15, right? Because on a fast break, let's be honest, shorter slides are better, correct? So communication for goalies is extremely important. If we could take Scotty Rogers and put him in Jack and Cannon's body, right, his mouth on Jack and Cannon, we would have the ultimate goalie in the world right now. Best, best takeaway checker in today's game. Best takeaway checker in today's game. They all pretty much suck. Uh, no, I'm kidding. They don't suck. <laughs> um, the best takeaway guy in today's game uh, was probably Brett Kennedy uh, from Syracuse. But he, he was handcuffed this year being behind. Uh, he's probably the best between the lines. I would also say Chris Fake. But, you know, right now, the guy that just came out of college, uh, who, who's, been, uh, who's been out of college, is Craig Chick, uh, the kid who, from Lehigh who was on with us with the Atlas. He can pickpocket a lot of guys. I do think he's, without a doubt, one of the best guys, at least in the pros, himself, Kyle Hartzell. Um, you know, those two guys have been, you know, you know, will be neck and neck when it comes to Cade Van Raphorst is excellent at putting the ball on the floor. Um, but those, that, those guys, from what I saw, uh, there wasn't any sneaky, sneaky guys out there that were, were takeaway guys. Um, but Brett Kennedy was about the best, uh, you know, I thought, uh, and as well as Chris Fake. Okay. Um, now, this is an important one because it's kind of something we do north, north of the border here. Yeah. But what are your thoughts on having the young kids start with short sticks and then switching to the long stick as they develop their stick skills? That's a good question. I, I started with a long stick personally. So the first stick I ever had, like I, the problem here in, in, in upstate New York and central New York is that they don't let them pick up long sticks until seventh grade. So what that does to the position is pigeonhole the big slow guy, right? It does that a lot, right? That also makes them late in development of their stick skill. So I personally think, I, you know, if I had sons, which I don't have sons, I have daughters you know, who are, who are honestly very good lacrosse players. Thank God. Um, I would give my kid a long stick right off the bat. Why not get them used to doing what they're going to do? I mean, I personally, it worked for me. I had a long stick first stick. My mother's like, this kid's a defenseman. He's big, he's aggressive. And then I cut the stick, you know, I, my mom was a hairdresser. She didn't care about spending money. You know, 20 bucks was tips for her for the day. So she'd buy me, you know, a shaft, you know, heads sticks weren't, $150 for a shaft or $120 for shaft and $100 for a head. It was 20 bucks for a shaft, 20 bucks for a, you know, for a head and, and, uh, and 10 bucks for a, a mesh kit. So I started, so that's what I believe in is that you should start with a long stick and then you should play some type of box or offense because that will 100% get your stick skills legit. I was fortunate that I started with a long stick and then I went and played indoor a ton um, when we were growing up, it wasn't box. It was just in the gym. We did it before school three times a week. We had a league. Our college, our high school coach was a legend in New York, and we had great teams that ended up in, you know, state championships every year. Um, so I got my stick skills up to par. The biggest way I found in order to develop stick skills as a long stick, the truth is wall ball doesn't do shit for you. Sorry. There's your – doesn't do anything. It's shooting. I have my guy shoot. 
There's just something about shooting with a long stick. It uses all the little muscles, develops all the, the strength that you need in order to swing this thing around and be effective with it. So I shoot. I also have goalies shoot. So shooting for me is big, but I would start with a long stick. That's just what I would do. And I would always have kids play box lacrosse because box lacrosse is excellent for IQ, excellent for being able to finish. It does so many great things. It opens up your game. Nice. Well, listen, Rick, we're, we're approaching quarter after here. There's no yep, I got it. Q&A. Um, yep. I think we wrap this up. You've done a tremendous job, my friend. Like this has been great I don't interaction. Know. I did an okay and, job. An okay nah, man, job, but hey, I, I love the content. I love the ideas. It's uh, it's something I kind of like to see. Like when you and I first talked, and I said, "Man, this is like your Instagram was popping off in my head," and I thought, "Man, this is this is something that really I gravitate to as a guy who came out the back door and box." um and and liking to see it so uh, to me it was tremendous and uh, you know pretty honored to have you on here no I, I appreciate you having me I mean guys um you know if you guys again have any questions just find me on Instagram or you know it's ric at mercuryprinting.net is my email shoot me an email there I'll do what I can to answer I have zoom and facetime and I, you know I just want to help you grow the sport and you know um I'm, I speak to guys. I'm speaking to, to Edge Canada next week. I have a, a clinic with the Buffalo guys on Wednesday. So I'm all for it. But keep up the good work. And I appreciate those that were even in other countries. This is an honor for me, for a guy who's played on the under-19 world team, man. I've, shit, if anybody needs a world team coach, I'm in. Just let me know. I'll go to another country. <laughs> There's my pitch. There's right. my pitch. Well, listen, Rick, thanks a lot. Guys, attendees, yeah. we're back at it at uh, noon tomorrow. Hope to see everyone there. You guys have a great night. Guys, be safe.